I'm reading from John chapter 21, and you can find it if you wish to follow on page 1546. John 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and then said, they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your note net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples asked him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumours spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. 
we know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Judith. Good morning. Lovely to see you all. Is it dark in here or is it my eyes? It is dark, isn't it? It's my eyes, okay. I need glasses. Okay. That's not the only thing. Um, finish these for me. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Revenge is sweet. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We live in a world that is pretty unforgiving when it comes to mistakes. Uh, We live in a world that doesn't tolerate rejection and failure, particularly from those who lead. Today, we learn more about Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, as he comes face to face with the one who said in John 13, 37, I will lay down my life for you. And then chapter 18, you aren't one of these disciples, are you? She asked Peter. I am not. Warming themselves by the fire, the men asked the same question. I am not, Peter replied. Then in 1826, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose Ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with them in the garden? With him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. Then Jesus was handed over to be crucified, that most brutal of deaths that we remembered just last Friday. If there was ever a time for revenge, this would be it. If there was ever justification for retribution, this is it, isn't it? If there was ever a location for it, this setting is perfect. It's in the north of Israel, quiet lake, not many people around, not many witnesses. Jesus had defeated death. He'd appeared to female and male disciples. And it's interesting that the writer of this great gospel has chosen this scene. Of the hundreds he could have chosen, he chose this scene. This scene particularly focusing on Peter and Jesus to conclude the gospel. Today I want us to... uh, I I, I would love for you to see these two things and and appreciate them. Uh, Firstly, how remarkable and consistent resurrected Jesus is to the disciples... And secondly, relatedly, in particular, how remarkable and consistent Jesus is to Simon Peter, the denier. Uh, firstly, firstly, I'd love you to appreciate how remarkable and consistent the resurrected Jesus is. It's easy to forget we're on holy ground as we come to John 21. As we get to this eyewitness account, uh, John's third account of Jesus' resurrection uh, uh, appearance, uh, one of the translations puts verse 1 like this. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias and he manifested himself in this way. Uh, That is, the the, the translation picks up, there's a manifestation of Jesus here. Uh, There's a revelation of Jesus here. This is, uh, let's not forget Easter Sunday. Uh, When we're seeing Jesus here, we're seeing the guy who hops out of the coffin at Easter. It's remarkable. Don't forget how remarkable this is, right? Uh, We're in supernatural territory as we meet Jesus here. Uh, This is a manifestation, a revelation of Jesus in his resurrection body. body. This is special. The question is, how is the resurrected Jesus going to act? Uh, We and the disciples find out uh, when they are in the middle of a lake in uh, the the, the sea, uh, Sea of Tiberias or the Lake of Galilee. Um, We know from other Gospels that the disciples have been commanded north uh, to Galilee. What do a bunch of uh, men do when they return home to their fishing village? Well, 
of course they go fishing. Uh, notice though, as often is the case, uh, which of the disciples takes the initiative? Who is it? It's Simon Peter. It seems that his denying has not hampered his position amongst the other disciples as the first to speak, the first to do. Uh, Simon uh, Peter suggests some nocturnal fishing uh, to seven Galilean uh, fishermen and uh, they are right there with him. In a matter of weeks, these guys had been lifted up to the giddy heights of Palm Sunday as they welcomed the king of Israel, their leader, into Jerusalem. Then they'd spiralled down Good Friday, depths of despair on Good Friday as they scattered, as they scarpered. And then they'd been swept up again in glory by the resurrection appearance of Jesus. Well, that has been a wild ride in just a week or two, hasn't it? A feed at the end of a good night's fishing was probably just what the doctor ordered. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good night's fishing. Did you notice that? Until, of course, Jesus comes to town. Have a look at verse 4 there with me. Uh, chapter 21, verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise it was Jesus. You can imagine the scene, can't you? Jesus calls out from the shore, lads, have you, you haven't caught anything? Uh, now, I'm not, I, I, I guess I am a little bit surprised that seasoned fishermen would look, listen to a backseat driver on the shore calling out with suggestions, but perhaps he sounded like someone with authority. I don't know. But after a night with no bites, he said, cast the net over that way, and so they cast it, and they struck angler's gold. Uh, don't you love Jesus? He, he's, it's he, even as if in his resurrected body, Jesus just can't help himself from providing people with more fish. Uh, Jesus' actions here are both remarkable but totally consistent with his uh, pre-Easter presence. Uh, some people's love languages are words of affirmation. Some people's love languages are acts of service. These guys, their love language is fish, and he gives them an abundance of it, right? 153 fish, 21 fish eat, each at least, a bounty that would normally have broken their nets. But the only thing here is being broken is records. A bit later, bread. The, the, the resurrected Jesus keeps providing in his resurrected body. He's both remarkable and consistent. Notice Simon Peter here, denying Peter. Uh, we, we noticed that the fishing was his initiative. Uh, notice also his response to Jesus. Uh, see, the minute that Simon Peter puts together the, this miraculous catch with uh, what's reported to be the voice of Jesus, he who denied Jesus not once, not twice, three times, what does he do? He can't help himself either. Uh, as they cast their nets into the lake, so Peter wraps himself up and casts himself into the water. Challenging in thoughts 100 metre time, he, he swims to Jesus because he cannot wait for the boat to get to Jesus. He's got to get there. Uh, it's so like Jesus to provide. And it's so like Peter to forget all that is past and cast himself again towards Jesus. And of course, when Simon Peter gets to Jesus, and Jesus says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me three times? Of course not. He doesn't say that, does he? They say revenge is a, be a dish best served cold, but Jesus didn't get that memo either. Jesus doesn't serve up revenge, does he? He serves up hot breakfast for hungry fishermen who had been out all night. Don't you love Jesus? To fleeing, deserting Peter, to difficult pig-headed Thomas, uh, to the other disciples who scarpered the moment things got hot in Jerusalem, the resurrected Son of God provides a miraculous bounty of fish and then he provides breakfast. Now, as with uh, the other appearances, manifestations of Jesus, uh, there is a certain amount of wariness amongst the disciples. They kind of know what Peter and John know. They kind of know that it's Jesus, but there's uncertainty there, there's uh, nervousness there, recognise that something supernatural is going on here. Uh, someone has jumped out of a coffin to be with them. They, they, you get that sense there. 
uh, as none of them ask, who are you? Uh, as if the evidence wasn't enough. Uh, Verse 13, Jesus came and took bread. He gave it to them and likewise the fish. He served them. Jesus had served them in his life. He'd served them in his death. And now in his resurrected life, he's serving them still. It's the same one who instructed disciples to love one another as I have loved you. And he keeps on loving them. Don't you love Jesus here? He's such a class act. And even today, the same Jesus is serving you now. In his resurrected life, he's providing for you everything you need. God the Son from his throne in heaven sustains all things by his powerful word. In the Son, all things hold together. He provides for our needs today. Don't you love Jesus? So consistent, so remarkable. That's the first thing to notice here. Please do appreciate just how just just how how remarkable the resurrected Jesus is. And just how consistent he is. The same man, same Lord who loves, feeds, cares, cares for his sheep. Please appreciate that. Now, secondly, please appreciate how remarkable and consistent Jesus is, in particular, to as he commissions Simon Peter and those like him. Uh, before we get to the commission uh, that Jesus gives Simon Peter, we first hear that piercing question. Verse 15, when they'd finished eating, uh, Jesus said to uh, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The question is essentially, do you love me? And that is a question for a known, predicted denier that would have been a hard question to hear. Notice the question has a rider though, doesn't it? More than these. It's not immediately clear what the these are. Uh, These could refer to the other disciples. That is, do you love me more than Thomas does and John does and Nathaniel does? But the problem is how can Peter know that and answer that? It could be asking, uh, it could be Jesus asking, do you love me more than you love Thomas, John, Nathaniel and the others? Could mean that. I mean, he jumped out of the boat, swam to Jesus, left the others. That's some indication, right? Now, it could be, do you love me more than these 153 fish that are lying there at your feet? Do you love me more than fishing? Because, mate, I'm calling you to be a fisher of men. You've got to love me, mate. You've got to love men more than fish. It's interesting that, Peter doesn't answer in a way that helps us understand who the these are. But what he does answer is an appeal to Jesus' knowledge. Yes, Lord, he says, you know, you know that I love you. Peter is right. Jesus does know. Now comes this remarkable commission of Jesus. After showing the disciples the miraculous care he has for them, uh, after showing them his intimate care for them in, in cooking them breakfast, he gives Peter this command, this commission. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Jesus asks again and again. Peter appeals to Jesus' knowledge and again we hear the commission slightly differently but much the same. Literally shepherd my sheep or pastor my sheep. And then, of course, it's played out a third time, verse 17. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Is this because Jesus doesn't know? Of course not. Peter is right. Jesus is not asking questions through lack of knowledge. The repeated question is no accident. And it stings for Peter. Uh, We hear... The third time this is asked in verse 17, that it grieved Peter, it it hurt Peter. The threefold question is is meant to remind Peter of his threefold denial. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus asking the question, do you love me? It's interesting when someone wrongs us, we often just try to move on by ignoring it. Do you notice that Jesus doesn't do that here? He he actually asks three times with purpose. 
and then he commissions Peter. Peter's commission is planted in the soil of his denial. Now, for the first time in this passage, I don't want to be there. I've wanted to be there all the way up until now, right? I would have loved to have gone out fishing. I would have loved to have gone, had that fishing story to add to my pretty feeble fishing resume. Uh, I would have loved to have eaten with Jesus and his disciples. But the minute these questions about faithfulness come up, undying love, undying devotion to Jesus, I'm glad Peter takes that. I'm glad that Peter is in the hot seat there. Because like his record, I know there have been times when my allegiance to Jesus hasn't been as wholehearted as it should have been. It's been a little bit quieter than it should have been. Uh, Peter's love here has been brought into question by Jesus, but despite all Peter's frailty, notice the remarkable commission that Jesus gives him. Feed my lambs, pastor my sheep, feed my sheep. I take it as three ways of saying much the same thing. Just like there's a repetition of love, there's a repetition of commission. And notice the background here, how Jesus has modelled He's modelled this type of care. Jesus feeds the disciples breakfast. And now he sets Simon Peter up to feed his sheep. Having fed Peter, he's telling Peter to feed others, to feed the lamb, feed the sheep. Now, it's remarkable. But again, it's very, very consistent, isn't it? It's very consistent with what the priest to Jesus expected of the disciples. Remember that his prayer for them, just back in chapter 17, uh, Peter will feed, shepherd God's sheep by feeding them from his word. Chapter 17, this is the prayer. Uh, Jesus prayed, verse 17 of chapter 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and are in me and I am in you. The purpose of John's gospel, we see at the head of our passage uh, in John 20, verse 31, that people would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that would find life in his name. All these people who believe need to be sanctified by God's word. They need to be so that they might be united in Christ. And that is the task of shepherd Peter, isn't it? And it begins by loving Jesus. And it continues by feeding them in the truth of Jesus. Now, Peter, by the gift of time and by the work of the Holy Spirit, realises that this task isn't just for him. Uh, You read about that in in his letter uh, to the church. Uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 says this, verse 1, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering who will share in the glory to be revealed. This is what he says to elders. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to share. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. That is a word to elders, Christian leaders, pastors, growth group leaders. The job of feeding the sheep is not just Peter's alone. Shepherding God's flock, watching over them, seeing that they are sanctified in the truth is the responsibility that the chief shepherd takes very, very seriously. Please notice the remarkable commission that Peter receives, but also how consistent it is with all that Jesus has said in his earthly ministry. Now we come to the second moment where I'm really glad I wasn't there, that I'm really glad I'm not sitting in Simon Peter's seat. Jesus says to him, verse 18, you see what he says to him? Very truly, I tell you, When you were younger, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this 
to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. When Jesus predicted Peter's denial way back in chapter 13, Jesus told Peter that he couldn't follow him at that point. But now, now he can follow him. The path has been cleared for Simon Peter to follow Jesus. Even to death. Perhaps, as church history suggests, an inverted cross under the Roman Emperor Nero. Peter, feed my sheep as I did. Peter, follow me to death. Follow me. Uh, Jen and I enjoyed uh, watching Downton Abbey some time ago now. Uh, set around World War One. We got Downton Abbey fans here, or is it just me? Yeah, good. Okay, we got some Downton Abbey fans. Good, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so one of the settings is around, around World War One. And uh, one of the issues that arose uh, in World War I in, in the Abbey was the issue of desertion. So in World War I, long before the diagnosis of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, in total, 300 no, uh, 306 British servicemen were executed at dawn by firing squads for deserting. That is, they were not killed by enemy bullets, but by the rounds shot from their countrymen's rifles. Uh, one of the sons of Downton Abbey's maids uh, dies, not as a war hero, but as a deserter. And it wasn't just shame on him, but it brought shame on his family. His mum wasn't able to see his name go up on the honour roll in town because he died without honour. Uh, she wasn't able to speak freely about his death in case someone might ask. Uh, his desertion cost him his life, but his desertion also cost his family the opportunity to grieve his death. In war, deserters are shot. In Christ, deserters are forgiven. Isn't that remarkable? Peter is here. What's more, deserters aren't simply shot. In Christ, deserters are forgiven and commissioned as officers. How remarkable is God's kingdom? We were commissioned as officers, servant leaders, shepherds of God's people. That is how the kingdom of Jesus is different. So secondly, do please appreciate how remarkable and consistent the resurrected Jesus is as he commissions Simon Peter and those like him. We've come to the end of the book of John and after an amazing first 18 verses of the book of John, you know, massive towering words of God, light and darkness, you'd be forgiven for wondering why John 21 is the conclusion to that same book. You'd be forgiven for wondering why John doesn't finish his account with the purpose statement in John 20 that mm, you may believe and find life in his name. Why finish with a bunch of yokels in a boat? Not a massive Easter scene from the capital, but a scene from the backwater. Not a massive crowd being miraculously fed but just a small boat full of fishermen experiencing an enormous catch and a hot breakfast. Not on the re returning king's revenge on a deserter, but his commissioning of a turncoat. Don't you think this is remarkable that we would end here? The kingdom of Jesus is from a different world to the one where revenge is a dish best served cold. Instead, in his kingdom, revenge is buried. Hot breakfast is served. Don't you love Jesus? Don't you love the crazy way that his kingdom works? Well, friends, if you do love him and you do love the way he works, let's keep feeding the sheep. Let's keep being sanctified in the truth of his words.